morning. Uh, this is our last morning. I wanted to thank the organizers. I thought this was a really great workshop, and uh, glad I came. Um, so let's see. For uh, let me just start by reminding reminding you what the problem was. Those of you, if there are those of you who didn't see my original talk, this should be fairly self-contained. Um, we've got this kind of unusual communication game. We've got Alice and Bob, and Alice is getting his input. permutation of 1 through n, and it's being streamed, sigma 1, sigma 2. And Alice is, as a vector, with n positions. And when she gets sigma 1, she's allowed to write in position sigma 1 a bit. And when she gets sigma 2, she can write a bit in this position. And she can't go back and change anything she's written. And when sigma n arrives, Alice does not get to write what she wants. She has to write b, which is the bit that comes in the stream. And then when Alice is all done, Bob gets to see the vector. And Bob has to output a subset j in 1 through n. And the requirement is that sigma n, the last thing in the permutation, has to appear, has to be in the set j. And the cost of this protocol on this particular input is the size of j. And what we're interested in is the worst case cost overall. So I'll, uh, let's say, so the cost of the protocol is uh, the max over sigma and b. We can think of J, the set that Bob outputs, as a function of sigma and B. Um, it'll be the worst case size. OK, so any questions about the problem? Now, yesterday I told you why one would want to consider such a thing. If you weren't here yesterday, you'll have to read the paper. I'm not going to spend time on that. So we'll just assume, yeah. Can prove anything about the average case complexity? Does that give anything to the Well, so again, everything, if you prove, all you need to prove is a lower bound on. Oh, so it's even easier. Okay. So it's easier. That's right. So we can define, you know, the value Vn is the minimum over all protocols. Uh, of the max over sigma and b of the cost, well, which is and um, I could replace I'll call v n bar the min over all protocols the average. And the conjecture, hypothesis, whatever you want, is that uh, there exists a delta such that Vn greater than or equal to n to the delta. And obviously, a stronger conjecture uh, so. 
And then I mentioned a couple of other conjectures. So if you're in the rand and if you're in the average case setting, once you fix a protocol, then you could look at um, how much does Bob learn about the um, sigma n given the the um, vector, and I call this vector gamma. So. Or you look at the, so under the, given that sigma and b come in randomly, you can look at what's the residual entropy of sigma and given gamma. It's easy to see that this conjecture would imply this one, which implies this one. Um, and then I mentioned so you could um, change the game by allowing um, Alice to write instead of a binary alphabet, you give her a k a k letter alphabet. And so you can now, um, well, let's just go back to the worst case one. So I'll write VNK, which is the game with the K letter alphabet. So you'd expect the larger you, the alphabet, the smaller the lower bound will be. But it still seemed reasonable to guess that increasing the alphabet to a constant size, it will still be expensive. Uh, so for some complicated zero, and as I mentioned yesterday, we really thought this one was true, but it's not. And well, we didn't know whether we thought this one was true, but this one is also false. Even for k equals three. Even for k equal three. And the behavior, in fact, so um, there's this protocol. Such that uh, H. And then also uh, for alphabet size k, let's say for alphabet size 3, uh, Vn3 is less than or equal to order log n. And Vn k is, uh, well, log. And this, by this I mean the iterated logarithm. So if I give you an alphabet of size 10, then it's log, log, log. There are protocols that go in log, log, log. Um, so to prove the conjecture, you just need to show that the entropy is positive, right? What's that? Anything bigger than zero would be good enough to prove the conjecture. Uh, no, why? What? For the, the oh. Uh, okay, the size determines the size of. Right. I mean, oh, you know, the if the mutual if this residual entropy is this, then you get a bound here of two to this power. So now you don't. Okay. So you don't so, have an entropy anymore, given these. I'm asking, is there a way to frame an entropy? No, I don't have an entropy conjecture that implies. So this sort of. I mean, one of the basics, for basis, the basic into. The conjecture that implies, unfortunately, it's not true. Yeah. I mean, 
it, it is possible that there may be yet another entropy version that would imply it because there's still some information theoretic intuition floating around here which maybe one could turn into a, a statement that one could prove, but this is what we tried and turned out not to be true. Okay, so yeah, and then I mentioned yesterday, so the protocols that do this have a certain property. So yeah, what I said yesterday was, well, now once you see these, it sort of should, it certainly destroyed our, you know, belief that this original conjecture was true. The, the belief was, I wouldn't say restored, but at least, you know, resurrected from the dead by the following observation, or the which was that if you look at the protocols which defeat these, then they have a certain, so, you know, these, um, the above protocols are, I'll call them monotone, and I'll tell you what that means. I said it very quickly yesterday. I'll say it a little more slowly now. Uh, are monotone, and what we showed was that Vn, call it M for monotone. So if you go back to the original thing and you restrict yourself to a monotone protocol, then this is at least something like square root n to round it down. I mean, it's very sharp. So the protocols that, that defeat these strengthenings definitely will not defeat the original conjecture. Um, but we know a non-monotone protocol. That's the best we know. A 0.99 is not important. So we know how to do something a little better than square root n, and the protocol is non-monotone. Wait, Mike? Yeah. Is the stronger conjecture for monotone protocol? Oh, are you saying, sorry, I, I, are you saying that the stronger conjecture is false even restricted to monotone protocol? Yeah, I'm saying the, these, fall, these conjectures here, the thing that defeats of them, you know, one's, the thing that defeats them are monotone protocols, which I'll tell you what they are in a minute. And then, but you know, if you think, so our thinking was, well, our, our reason for thinking this was true in the first place was sort of made it, would just as well lead us to believe that these are true. These are false, but they're false for reasons that will give a monotone protocol for them. But if you now go back here, so I don't know exactly, you know, you can draw whatever conclusions you want from all this. Um, yeah. I think I missed one step. Yes. What Alice, does Alice has to send to Bob during the entire vector? Yeah. But does, does it make a difference whether n is odd or even? Or? Uh, no. Let's have, give me a protocol. What if Alice writes once in, assume the length is odd? And you write ones in even positions and zeros in odd positions. So that the last bit cannot be different from. It's adversarial. The ad adversary gives you the string. He knows your protocol and he gives you the string. Okay. Does that, okay. Does that answer? I used the first five minutes yesterday, so I didn't. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, all right. So there's a bunch of stuff I got about uh, 15 minutes. And all of these things, each one of them takes five minutes to explain. But I don't, you know, five, five minutes is really ten. But, you know, so I can't do them, I can't do them all. Uh, but let's, so let me start by showing you the entropy one, because I think that's, since we're, it's an information theory, theory workshop. Okay, so I want to show you a protocol where at the end, the amount of uncertainty that Bob has about the last position is very low, all right? Although, what well, we'll see this protocol, Vn for this protocol is still very big. In fact, even Vn bar is gonna be like n over log n or something like that. But, uh, okay, so what's the protocol? We're talking about uniform distribution? Pardon me? We're talking about uniform 
about uniform distribution on, on strings, right? Uh, on sigma, yeah, in sigma and b. Yeah, it's uniform. Yeah. Oh, so I need to, let me say something which I should make a remark. So what is a strategy? This is, uh, I don't need this for the, for the protocol, but it's something to have in mind. What, is, what exactly formally is a strategy for this thing? So, you know, at every step, Alice, Alice is getting the permutation and she has to decide what to write. And what she writes can depend on a bunch of stuff. She can write, on, it can depend on, the permutation she's seen so far, right? Now, based on the permutation she's seen so far, she she's, has a vector. You know, she wrote one here and zero here and one here, and everything else is stars. There's nothing here yet. And now the next thing comes in, position i. And she looks at, you know, these things. And there's also the order in which these guys came. Okay, and what she writes here could, in principle, depend on the order and on what she wrote. And you know, one little lemma is that without loss of generality, the order in which these guys came doesn't matter. You can assume that what she writes next depends on you know, the position that just came in and what's already written here. But it doesn't matter what order these things came in. That's a, that's a simple lemma that you can prove that without loss of generality, you can restrict to those strategies. We call them, in the paper, we call them, um, I guess, order insensitive protocols. So they, they, they don't depend on the order of the things that already came in. They only depend on the subset and what's actually written here. So then her strategy looks like this. You know, for every partial assignment, and for every bit that's not assigned, then there's a, a specify, you have to specify, given this partial assignment and this bit, should you write zero or write ones? Okay, so for, so what it's a, it's a function, f sub i, for each i, so for all i, you know, goes to either zero or one, where alpha is a partial assignment, um, of all the bits, of, of some subset of the bits. So this ranges over all partial assignments in which i is not yet assigned. Okay, is that clear? So that's what a strategy is. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna tell you what Alice can do to make Bob's entropy really small. So I'm going to pick a parameter, t I'll fix a parameter t, and t will eventually be... Also Bob is just a function. What? Also Bob is just a function. Bob is a function which, yeah, you look at the... From binary vectors to subsets. Okay. So the, the strategy is going to fix a parameter t which will eventually be log squared n, but we'll see what t has to be. And Alice does the following thing. For the first n minus t steps, n minus t steps, Alice writes zero. That's pretty easy. Okay, now, now comes the work. So now there's t steps, and t, we'll see in a minute, t is going to be greater than or equal to uh, log n. So let's interpret uh, the index set one through n, just by associating it as uh, So instead of the index set being one through n, the index set is binary vectors of length k. 
and uh, so T is going to be, well, I'll say bigger than K. So I've written zeros here. Let's assume, you know, just n is a power of 2, so we've got all vectors of length k. If you, if you view these as vectors in g of 2 to the k, then the sum of the vectors is 0. And let's look at all the vectors corresponding to where you've written 0, and that has a certain sum. And we know that the sum of everything is 0. And here's what Alice does. She looks at what she hasn't filled in zeros yet. Like each of these entries are vectors and not? What? No, not the, the index, the indices. The label, right? The, the, they were 1 through n, and now each thing is just indexed by. And now I'm saying that she's written 0 in certain places and just look at the indices there and add them up mod 2 as vectors. We know that the sum of everything is 0. So she looks at the indices she hasn't written in yet and she identifies a subset and the subset will be the, the lexicographic, the, well she looks at um, the lexicographically smallest subset of indices, which combined with these sums to zero. Okay, so, so for example, everything is good. Yeah, so for example, if you you know if you sum everything, but you know, you could take subsets of these and uh, well I claim that so let's see. Um, Log n of them. What? You need at most log n of them because, you know, look at the complement of what you picked. So that will also sum to zero. And if the set that you chose, you know, the whole, you, you have the set that you have to combine with this. You can throw away anything that sums to zero. You can throw away anything that sums to zero. And there's, if you've got more than log n vectors, then, okay. So there's some set that you identify, which I'll call a uh, no, I don't call, want to call it J because J is, so let's call it uh, S. So, you're, if you're using, so when you say lexicographic order, the lexicographic order is an increasing order of set size? No, so, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, so yeah. Like the smaller sets show first and then bigger. Yeah, so in other words, you're going to find the smallest set, which this, among, first you say, what's the size of the smallest set that I can combine with this to get zero? And then, subject to that, I pick the one that's lexicographically smallest, where I, I order them now according to the, you know, some fixed ordering on the vectors, for, on the for indices. Versus one through n. Not, not this subset, because Bob doesn't know this subset. Right. That's right. Okay. And now what's the, what does Alice do? She's going to write um, zeros in the set S, and she'll write ones everywhere else. So she's going to have identified this small subset of the remainder. There were T things left. And she's going to write one in the things in S complement, and zero everywhere else. So that's the protocol. Except in the last version. Well, she does. She can't control the last one. Okay, so now let's let's see what from Bob's point of view. So, Bob looks at the positions where he gets ones at the end, and he adds up the vectors corresponding to those ones, and I claim if the sum is non-zero, how could that happen? Well. One what? Corrupted by B. B is zero. Yeah, it means that there was a there was something. Now, it could have been E corrupted. You know that the last one was oh, should have been a one and it was changed to a zero, or the last one should have been a zero and corrupted to a one.
But in any case, if you add those up and you actually look at the vector mod 2, that actually is the index that was corrupted. That was the last one. It has to, so in other words, if the sum is non-zero, it uniquely determines what the lat, what sigma n is, and Bob will be able to output a set of size one. <laughs> okay, and otherwise, so now the, the 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 harder case, not not much harder, is the sum is zero. Okay, now. If the sum is zero, then that, that could happen in two ways. Well, you know, that means that uh, the final bit B actually was what Alice wanted to write. Now, the final bit B could have been a zero or it could have been a one. However, conditioned on what is the probability that the last bit that arrived is one where Alice wanted to write a one. Well, it's t minus the size of s over t. Because Alice, you know, s is the ones where Alice wants to write a zero, and that's s over t. And think of t as a lot bigger than s. So with very, with, with high probability, the bit that arrives at the end is one where Alice wanted to write a one. Okay. So if you work out now, so can, if you look at the conditional information, what happens is it's highly likely. So let, let's just, uh, you know, let's do this entropy argument correctly. So how much information, what is the information that Bob needs in order to now know how much more information? So if we're in one of two cases. Either the bit that arrived at the end was one of the things where you wanted to write a zero or you wanted to write a one. So I first reveal, you know, with one bit I can tell you, in which, I can tell Bob in which situation you're in. So I'm trying to bound the, the residual entropy. And I say, well, I'll give away one bit by telling you which situation you're in. Now, if you're in this situation, how much entropy is there? Well, there's actually a lot because what I know that if this is the case, that the last bit that arrived is one of the zeros, almost everything is a zero. So that in that case, there's like log n bits. But the chance that this happens is only s over t. And in this case, well, how much information, uh, then you know that it's one of the ones. And the amount of ent entropy left is log t. And it's one minus uh, s over t. So let's ignore that here. So you get you know s over t log n, s log n over t plus log t. So how should you choose t? Well, how about choose t equal log squared n? Uh, I want, yeah. So if I choose, if I choose t to be, oh, and s we said was log was at most log n. So if I choose t, t to be log squared n, the contribution here is just constant. And the contribution here is log log n. So the residual entropy is log is at most log log n. Okay. And I guess I don't have much time to tell you anything else. Uh, so I just want to see if I can give a hint. Uh, let me just tell you carefully what monotone means. Okay, this protocol is monotone, the other protocols are monotone, and then I, that's all I'll, I won't have time to tell you much else. Um, so we said that each of these functions, fi, takes as input alpha and then outputs, you know, either zero or one, or if the alphabet is larger, zero, one, or two. So, this is a partial assignment. 
Let's look at the partial order on partial assignments, which says just, you know, uh, if you take a partial assignment and you change some stars to something else, then that's greater. Okay. And now I look at the function which maps the partial assignment, and I want, with respect to that partial order, it, it should be monotone. Which means that initially, f when, when things are sparse, you start, you're going to write zeros. And then eventually, depending on what happens in alpha, you'll change, you'll say, oh, well now if i arrives, I'll write a 1 in that position. And then after a while, you might change and say, I'll write a 2 in that position. Okay, so it's monotone in that sense, okay, and it's easy to see. This one's kind of trivially monotone because in every position you write a zero, except at this crucial stage you change and you say, okay, in this set of positions I'll write a one. And then you never change your mind again. You're just going to write, it's you sort of fix it. So this one is trivially monotone. And I'll say that there's sort of, the protocol for the K thing is also sort of it's, there's a trivially monotone protocol which works if your alphabet size is three. So uh, you could of course change the interpretation of zero and one. Uh, well, you could, but I'm not sure what you're... No, so I mean, what looks like a monotone and one interpretation may not look like monotone. Yeah, so all I'm saying is the, protocols I, the protocol I gave you is monotone, okay? And now the, the, the result is if you restrict yourself to monotone protocols, then for every, for every monotone protocol, the worst case cost. So the worst case cost of this protocol is really bad because there are situations where your uncertainty is really big. And I'm saying that that's actually true of any monotone protocol. The worst case uncertainty is at least square root n. So. You know, I'm not sure what to make of it. We can, de we can defeat these stronger things, but we defeat them with protocols which have a property that we know is not enough to defeat the original conjecture. No, and maybe there was a, no. We didn't. We kind of gave up on entropy once, but maybe there should be a look. Original conjecture can you give a lower bound of log n, which is known. Yeah. Right. So it would be yeah. I mean, so that is a a direction that has been in the back of our mind that we should check sometime, but we haven't done it. So. Checking the VNZ list log n. What's that? Yeah. yeah, to prove Vn is at least log n. Uh, I mean, the easy solution. Uh, I think that follows from this uh, um, paper. Chong et al. paper on uh, this hypercube problem. Uh, so, which is it? Chong, Dan, Freddy, Seymour. Oh. So, suppose you have more than half uh, of the Boolean cube, a set S of more than half the Boolean cube, then there's, they study the problem of um, find a, find a, a vertex in this set, which has high degree within this set. They prove that it's, there's a vertex of degree of at least log n, but it's like roughly log n within the set. And um, they conjecture that, or, or it's, the problem is posed that maybe there's one that's of degree at least n to the delta for some delta. So this is the same thing for proving that sensitivity of any function is greater than log n, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the problem that I, but it's not clear that the conjectures go in the reverse direction. That's what, in other words, that's what I'm not. I'm not sure. It's true that a lower bound on V n implies a lower bound on their problem, but I'm not convinced. I mean, it may be, but I'm, I, I'm not convinced that the lower bound goes in the opposite direction. I don't want you to miss your flight, but uh, can you give us a hint about what happens with the three symbols, or would that? Uh, um, yes, I will give you, I'll try to do it in one minute. So in three symbols, for, the, for all but 100 log n, you're going to say zero. Okay. And just in the last log n. So what you want to do is 
you're going to um, you want to to give Bob enough information. So now there's a set called a T elements left. T is now not log squared, but okay. So you want Bob to be able to figure out what that set is. Okay. Now Bob is almost going to know that set because you're going to not write zeros in that. You're going to write ones and twos, but maybe the adversary writes a zero in the last position. So there's some uncertainty, which is like an erasure that the and okay, but what you can do is you're going to use an error correcting code to be able to uh, enable him to sort of recover by looking at what you write in these positions you, to recover actually what that last position was. Okay, well, I don't, you know, so that's roughly what you're going to do. Yeah, by the way, there is a paper on this, which was in, uh, which was in ITCS, and it should be on one of our web pages, but I can't promise it is, but I'll put it on there, so. Um.